and I'm very um, happy to be facilitating for my colleagues today. Dr. Cheryl Brown and Genevieve Haupt will be telling us a little bit more about personal mobile devices in the classroom, opportunities and challenges. I'd first like to share a short introduction um, a little, uh, about who they are. So Dr. Cheryl Brown is a senior lecturer and part of the Learning Technologies team in SALT at UCT. And she is also the principal investigator for a Carnegie funded project on developing educational technology professionals in Africa and a DHET funded, which is Department of Higher Education and Training in South Africa, funded cross-institutional project, the Personal Mobile Devices Project. Jen is part of the, also part of the Learning Technologies team and is a part-time project manager and researcher on the DHET uh, mobile devices project. I'm not going to share you share their full bios with you. Instead, I'm going to share a link and you can read more. And I'm going to hand over to Cheryl. And also, feel free to qu uh, type in your questions in the text chat. I'll collect them and then at intervals, Cheryl, you can let me know when you'd like to take some of those questions. Cool. Over to you, over to you Cheryl. Thank you for that lovely um, introduction, Nicola and team. I'm feeling very confident about this session because I've got three Jakobs on board and I know that no problems will happen as long as we've got three Jakobs supporting us. So welcome to everybody and welcome to Jakob 1, 2 and 3 as well. <laughs> Um, Jen and I are going to divide the session up. Um, Jen's going to introduce the first part and um, what we're going to do is while Jen's presenting, I'll um, watch the chat and make notes of the questions and even see what I can answer as we're going along. Uh, we're very keen to hear about some of your experiences and we're going to have a couple of opportunities in the presentation just to stop and check in um, with you guys. We'll do a poll um, sort of near the beginning and we'll try and get a sense of um, how our project resonates with you in your various contexts as well about um, halfway through. So we're hoping to make it a bit more interactive but I really do appreciate you all having sort of giving up the time to come today and I'm very excited to be live streamed on YouTube. I just wish there was somebody important to watch and listen to me. I thought I might send the link to my son at home but I thought no, he's never going to want to sit and listen to a presentation by his mum so I don't even think I can get the numbers up that way. Anyway, Jen, um, let me let you introduce the project um, and let people know what it's all about. I'll hand over to you. It's just got all quiet your side, Jen, despite the fact your microphone was flicking and worked seconds ago. Okay, I'm muted. There we go. I think that's working. There you go. It is. Yes. Okay. So, there we go. Yeah, I was I was just saying it was so nice that we had, everybody was here, a lot of people were here um, a few minutes before the actual start of the presentation because it's so interesting to hear from people and also just to hear some of the challenges that they've experienced. Um, we will talk to some of these challenges as well. Um, so just to get started, um, there's, there's been the recognized role across South African universities um, around educational technology in facilitating teaching and learning activities. And while this recognition has taken place, there still remains this moral and economic dilemma in South Africa and many of the developing countries as well, um, as students come from different backgrounds, so in ge geographical locations with varying material and techn technological capabilities or capacities. So this then means that owning your own device or as well as communication technologies can't be assumed across uh, universities, especially with students. So over the last five years, UCT has explored um, ownership as well as use of personal mobile devices uh, across two different projects. And these projects are the learning, the flexible learning project, 
with a specific device being a laptop, and then the personal mobile device project with the specific use of a tablet. So I've been involved in the second project, but I'll give a background to both projects. So the Flexible Learning Project, um, it, it ran from 2013 to 2015 with the main aim of increasing flexible learning and to ensure equity in terms of ICT access. Uh, there were four departments at UCT that were involved in this project, and that's physics, law, chemical engineering, and architecture. So this project uh, it had a strong emphasis on equity, as previously mentioned, um, because students on financial aid were less likely to be able to afford devices, and these students uh, were therefore provided with laptops. So since the inception of this project in 2013, there's been 1,582 students that have registered across the four courses. Um, and of these students, 243 were provided with laptops. We've provided a link uh, to this project and to the report of this project, because the main focus of our presentation is uh, the second project that I've been working on. So this is the personal mobile device project. And here, the main aim was to investigate, investigate how, um, how to create models of equitable access for bringing your own devices for teaching and learning in the context of unequal access. So this is something that I noticed that um, one of the other people, participants, have mentioned previously. The ease is unequal access. So our research site was the Extended Degrees Program within the Department of Humanities here at UCT. And within this department, there are five academics who teach on, this, on these introductory courses. So the main reasons for selecting this course or program was that the majority of students came from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, also, the courses had a blended learning approach. And finally, because we had a well-established relationship with one of the, the lecturers on this course. So how we actually planned our interventions um, over the last uh, two years, well, almost two and a half years, uh, we conducted a needs assessment to ascertain whether the students had a good enough device for learning, for the learning needs. So this was done at the start of um, the academic year. It was actually done in the first, actually, was it orientation? We added, we tried to set it up that we could do it during orientation so that at least we would be aware of who these students were and provide access to devices before they actually started their various courses, these introductory courses. Um, so based on this, we then distributed devices. And in, two, in 2016, there were 218 students who enrolled for this program. This is the Extended Degrees program. And we managed to distribute 75 devices to these students. So these students who received it, they did not have, or they indicated that they didn't have a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop. And this is the, the, the basis upon which we selected them. Um, in 2017, the circums changed a bit at UCT because fully funded NASA students in their first year received laptops. So we only ended up distributing 20 devices to students. And these were the students who didn't, didn't have a laptop. And in some cases, they had um, cell phones, smartphones, <coughs> excuse me, but they didn't have a tablet or a laptop. Um, and because we wanted to ensure that the maximum number of students who require devices would receive devices, we wanted an entry-level device. And we wanted something that was good enough for students to be able to use for their learning needs. This is the actual device. It's the ProLine um, 10882M. It's a 10-inch tablet. And we've also managed to give students covers and keyboards to the cost of only 2,541 rand. So just an overview of some of the research that was conducted over the past few years. Um, I've done classroom observations. We have gone in to observe how students have used the devices in the classroom. I've also conducted interviews with lecturers to investigate their perceptions around their own use of devices, the personal mobile device use, as well as using PMDs in the classroom. This also touched on 
um, technology use as well in the classroom and outside of the classroom. The focus groups as well that I conducted over the last few years was around uh, students' PMD use. So these were our students who received the devices. Um, so it was around how they, what they used before receiving the devices. Um, how they've been using the devices that we had provided, um, both inside and outside of the classroom. And we had a particular interest as well, especially around the, the protest, because this project had been taking place over the last few years when we've had various protests as well. Yeah, so this is the point where we have our poll. Um, and we're just interested to know in what were some of your interests in listening to this presentation. I think Jakob has taken over. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There we go. Yeah, just to select yeah, your response. Sorry about that. Thanks, Cheryl. And as I said at the start, it was interesting for us to start a bit earlier because at least having some people there. Um, some of the interest, I think, came out in when people introduced themselves as well. That's quite interesting. Can everybody see the results? Is it just us? as we're typing, or do we have to do something for you to see what's happening? Oh, you can. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, Tanya. OK, that sounds great. I think it stopped moving. I can't quite tell whether that's everybody. but Yeah, I'm also trying to figure out if that's everybody, but I think it's the majority of people. Um, yeah, quite interesting, I think, is that the interest around issues around access um, I think that has always been one of our main interests in the project, and as well as some of the other work that we're doing. I think I'm going Thank to close you. it now. Can you close that? Yeah. Can you close it, Jane? Yeah, I can. Thank you, everyone. Let's just move on. Uh, here we go. Thank you. So now we'll just present some of our findings. Um, and this is findings in the classroom. So there's a mixture of some of the things. Well, this is mainly the focus here on the lecture interviews. Here we go. So what we found was that um, the lecturers then, in the next two slides at least, um, it was how lecturers teaching on the same course employ different strategies when it comes to using PMDs in the classroom, and obviously for various reasons as well. So the slides that will be coming up now are quotes from our actual interviews. Um, so I, I won't read them again because it's obviously on the screen, so I'll just talk to the, to the next two slides. Uh, so some lecturers struggle with tensions between using technology in the classroom and face-to-face -face interactions. And the main struggle here then uh, is the fact that it could be a distraction and it could detract from various discussions. And this is something that this one lecturer had pointed out quite strongly. Another lecturer equates the use of technology in the classroom as a bit of a headache because of the lack of the necessary infrastructure, such as laptops or um, projectors, and this would then mean that lecturers themselves would have to carry these bulky uh, pieces of equipment when they wanted to use or make use of this in the classroom. So in some cases we found that um, the lack of infrastructure was a problem, but then there are venues around the university that do have infrastructure, like they do have uh, devices set up already. And in that case, uh, one of the lecturers said, if she knew she was going to a class where she had that, she would make use of various visual aids, such as uh, videos. She would also prepare um, her presentations and her, her whole lecture. She prepared online so that she had simple access to these materials when she arrived in the classroom. So um, in addition, this lecture would also use online 
online facilities, or in addition to using the online facilities, she would also use the Blackboard in the classroom. So she made use of various ways of, of conducting her lectures. Let's go to the next. Um, and from this, we can already see that uh, lecturers feel differently about the use of technology uh, in the classroom. Um, but there is an acknowledgement amongst these lecturers that technology is an important part. And uh, it's being used more and more in the educational setting or landscape. So while lecturers have the reservations about students making use of the devices in the classroom, as in, uh, as you can see in this quote that we have up, um, they realize that students make use of of devices for ac academic purposes as well, because often they feel like they are doing a lot of personal things. But when one of, like as one of these lecturers had said. Uh, they caught a student on their device, and when they asked them, what are you doing, they actually said they're using it to look up a word. So it's clear by these quotes that um, the lecturers are realizing that uh, it's place, that there is place for, for devices and technology in the classroom, but they're still wanting to, to avoid any distractions um, by the use of these devices, both on their part as well as when they allow students to use it in in the classroom. I'll just leave that one up and hand over to Cheryl. Thank you. Oh, I'm on. Is that one of the cases where you could, there we go. I'm on now. Hey. Thank you, Jen. So I mean, I think just looking at some of your comments in the chat as well. Um, what interested us and the reason we focused on the different approaches is we were looking at a single course with five lecturers and each of them had different personal views about using technology. Um, this was, you know, some of them were reluctant, um, they didn't use it a lot personally, others were passionate about um, technology and their cell phone and social media use was um, really quite, um, was sort of quite large. And it I think what we did is instead of making it something that was compulsory, we had this enabling environment and we, we let the lecturers choose how they would open up the spaces in their classroom. So for some, it enabled them to make more dynamic lectures um, in, the, in that one example. But for others, it really was just a matter of they did what they were comfortable with and they let students use the spaces in the way that they that they wanted to. So yes, sometimes, you know, students would, as we can see from this slide, um, you know, would get an SMS or the phone would ring or something. And then academics had to change their practice and say, actually, you know, that's not acceptable in class. Just like if this happened in a movie theater, we'd all glare at the person next to us whose cell phone rang. Um, and they began to see that when they actually created spaces for students to use devices in the class, it opened up more opportunities. So it didn't actually, we weren't looking at the whole issue of did students get better marks. But we were looking at how it made learning more flexible and how it um, allowed lecturers to explore perhaps a more dynamic um, pedagogy. So I think that, that was the sort of the view we got from the lecturer. Interestingly, after doing this for a year, and for some people being, they weren't anti it, but being sort of more on the outside of this. Everyone is, very, all the lecturers are very enthusiastic about the possibilities for next year. I mean, they, they couldn't go back. They couldn't go to a, a space where they now had to say to students, you can't, you can't bring your technology into the classroom. They're all thinking now about ways they can expand what they're doing, ways of, um, creating the opportunities to do some um, interactions to get students actually participating in the content of the lecture while they're teaching. So the section I'm going to focus on now is what happens out of the classroom. And we've got this in and out of the classroom sort of framing because in the classroom is the space the lecturer controls. It's the space where they're at the front and they're driving the learning experience, whereas out of the classroom, it's what the student's doing. It's, um, it's how they're using it in perhaps unexpected ways. And that's probably a lot of um, the sort of things that might be going on in WhatsApp um, that the lecturer might not even be aware of in terms of the learning experience. So one of the things that we see um, the use of the, of the techno, the legitimization of technology in the learning experience helping with is this whole transition from school to university. 
Now, it's interesting because this isn't about learning. This isn't, do I get better marks? But it is very important because it's about supporting learning. So for some students, what they, what they said was having their own device helped them make that shift between moving from school to university. Um, it helped them learn how to study more independently. It gave them confidence. It helped them have access to the resources that they felt they needed. So there was a sense of which the technology enabled them to, it helped them change their pattern of learning and that sort of perhaps those practices that they'd become accustomed to at school that they now had to change when they became more independent, self-driven learners at university. The other thing it helped them do in terms of transitions was keep connected with their family. So yes, a cell phone does that, but we also found that in terms of the tablets, students got very smart with doing things like web WhatsApp. Um, and in, in particular, during the times of the protests, one of the students' phones died or got broken, and she put the SIM card into the tablet, got onto web WhatsApp, and was able to stay in touch with her parents. So that support between home and university and being able to be in touch with your, your people you care about, it turns out to be very important for, uh, for students. At the, you know, and it's something we often forget, the importance of the effective di dimension, motivation, moral support, you know, not feeling lonely or alienated. So that was one thing where we saw the sort of out of the classroom benefits in terms of the devices. Internet access turned out to be a, a very big talking point. So just having a device didn't actually enable access, as one would know. So students became, became very aware of the fact that now they had a tablet, it did, still didn't mean they could do anything wherever they liked because they didn't always have internet. Um, and so what we can see here is you know, students are saying, well, it's great, but when I don't have internet, there are all these problems. You know, I'm on campus, and I might be connected to the campus Wi-Fi or network in some way, but when I'm off campus, what do I do when I don't have internet? And what it did is it started to get the students to change their, um, their sort of management strategies in a, in a way so that um, they had to plan for the times they were offline. So students became used, it sort of came to know um, the YouTube app. So I'm not sure if you're all aware, but when, you, when you're browsing YouTube on a web you know, through a web browser, it all has to be live and you've got to be online. But the app allows you to download um, resources to watch when you're offline. And so they began to learn that. They, they figured out how to use um, the online offline features of Google Documents, for example. And even in terms of their formal learning space, what they would do is they would make sure they downloaded all their, um, their resources and their lecture notes and everything when they were on campus. And then they'd read and work through them asynchronously when they weren't on internet um, access. So it helped, um, it helped students, students had to learn new practices for being offline but having access to technology. And obviously it would make life so much easier if we could all be online and connected all the time. But even here, and we're professionals, as Alice was saying, it, you, you know, you're in and out of, um, of bandwidth all the time. So I think in our, in our developing context, we really do have to realize that you can never rely 100% on being connected and that we've just got to learn um, strategies for when we're not connected, both as teachers and as students. So the other thing that really helped us was flexibility of learning. So this is actually a picture that Nicola took, I think, when we did our, um, our laptop project. And it shows that students are connect, want to be connected anywhere, anytime. It's not just in the lecture theater or at their desk at home. It's in the corridor, it's in the bus, it's in bed, it's wherever it is. It's all about being connected when you need to be and being able to learn at that time when you need to. So again, I mean, we're using the example of the protest just because that was a very, that was a particular time when students didn't have the access that they'd come to rely on. Um, and that was, um, that was something that really you know, affected them last year. So. You know, it allowed them to be more flexible. What they would do is they, we heard these very interesting examples of how students would not actually come onto campus, but would come around the edge of campus to get our, um, our campus edge room Wi-Fi, download what they needed to, and then um, go home and work. But having the device meant that for, the, for these students, they could carry on working and studying. I mean, of course, students would much rather stay in bed. So I love the second quote where they say, you know, 
you can wake up and take a shower and then work. Well, actually, for most of them, it's just stay in your pajamas and work. But also being able to do things like tests or rewrite tests or assignments in their own space and not being reliant on labs. So the convenience of that is just fantastic. And I had a fabulous um, example in an interview that we did with a student where she said, you know, she had this problem and she was studying at two in the morning, as students appear to do. And um, you know, she, she didn't know the answer and she knew she was going to have to ask the lecturer the next day, but she didn't want to appear stupid in class because what if everyone else knew the answer and uh, it was only her that didn't understand this particular concept. So she went online and she did some searching on YouTube and she had a look at some resources and then she realized um, what the problem actually was and helped her reframe her problem and her question better so when she got to class the next day, she could actually ask the question confident that she'd really made an effort to try and understand it when she was grappling with this problem in the middle of the night. So um, I mean, I think things like that, just in time learning, having access is just hugely valuable for students. Um, we've also seen a huge improvement in their digital literacy, but what that means is not somebody that becomes wedded to the device. What we see is students who are using the devices when and where they need them. So this is, shows how um, a very practical, tangible discipline like architecture, um, so I think this picture happened to be taken with architecture students, um, where drawing and constructing and building is part of what they do, how students can link in technology and the sort of physical, um, tangible work that they need to do together. So you'll often see, see images of students, if you're walking around our campus, where they've got you know, the textbook and the laptops piled on top and then notepads piled on top of the laptop or the tablet. It's all about um, being able to use the device in the way that you need to. So students would quickly learn how to get apps on the, on the tablets and do things. So one of our um, pilots, um, we found the lecturer wanted to get the students to create videos. And the moment that she got the tablet, she suddenly said, no, it's never going to work because she can't use the software she needs to use. And then we said, well, ask the students what they do. And it turns out that you know, when you've got a tablet, you don't use software. You don't install sort of very memory, um, hard drive heavy software. You use applications. So the students would get onto the Google App Store if they, um, if they were on the Android system, and they'd download apps. And the apps would be what they'd use to, to do the tasks that they needed to. Um, so, and also what students were doing is finding out that you could be online on your tablet and just type stuff and immediately put your things up on your learning management system. So Vula here refers to our learning management system at, the, at UCT. So they could post things on Vula straight from their tablet or they could type it and when they were in connectivity, they could upload it. They could write their blogs. They could copy and paste um, media across things. So it, it was immensely helpful in developing their confidence in working in a digital environment. And many of these students um, came from very much more feature firm backgrounds. So the students who got the tablets had really not had, a, had had very little exposure to computers, had not, didn't own a computer themselves. And so the tablet was the first sort of keyboard structured device that they'd, that they'd started to use. And they very quickly managed to figure out how you use it effectively for their learning. So I'm actually just interested in this point, and I notice there's a couple of things in the chat. It's just out of these things that we've been talking about, how much of this um, speaks to the context that you're in, and how much of this is different? So um, I mean, Kola says, yes, these are issues that are current in his Nigerian context too. So I mean, that's that's good to see. So I'm just going to sort of have an opportunity to have a look through the chat. Jane, you've been reading the chat. If you want to grab the mic and just highlight some of the, the similarities and differences between the experience we found in our project and um, what the rest of our colleagues have experienced. I'm just going to pause for a moment. Yeah, I think there's the, the quite a few things. And it's, it's quite interesting. It would be nice if we had a three day to present a whole project because people, a lot of things that people have been raising are things we've found as well. So um, just the accessibility, the, the ease of access for the students that have devices and how they manage to work outside of the classroom with these devices. Um, uh, those are some of the things that came up in digital literacy. Are there courses and policies in place? So people are asking about that as well. 
Um, I think people, there's a lot more questions that I've seen than experiences. Um, yeah, I think we could just open it up and people could just then indicate if there are, are more experiences. I mean, at the beginning of the session, there were more experiences listed um, where people were talking about connectivity as well. Um, these are similar uh, challenges that we experience at UCT and especially with the shutdown. We've experienced that as well and students are struggling a lot with that, even the students on or the students away from campus, the ones that the ones that do do not live um, on res. So yeah, there was a lot of those as well. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Jane. That does help. So maybe what I won't do is answer because Nikki says she's been pulling some questions into a document, and we do have a Q and A session at the end. But just in terms of picking up on some of your experiences and comments. Um, I think what we found as well was there are some spaces in our campus that where lecturers are absolutely saying you may not have a device in our classroom. And even in this course where we were piloting this, there were some lecturers that preferred students not to bring the devices into the classroom, but they didn't really feel comfortable saying no. And then at some stage they went, OK, no, this is too disruptive. I don't want you to have it in the class. And other lecturers were quite comfortable with it. So it is a very personal thing. I'm not sure if one can have a pol It would be horrible to have a policy that said in a learning context that you were not allowed devices in a classroom. So like. Um, you're describing at the, um, so like John's saying in Ghana um, at boarding schools, you're not allowed to use mobile devices at school. Um, I, can, I mean, I can understand that at a school level, but in our learning, op, in our in our experience, the moment you open it up and you don't actually have to do anything, you just have to say they're not banned if you're using them for learning. And it's, students are very quick to point out when other students are going off topic because it distracts them. So we'll see students telling another student to shut down their, their tablet because they're on Facebook and it's being distracting. So if you're starting and you find ways to bring it in, have quick polls, get students to look up things for you and topics, get them to say what they found online, get them to suggest resources, you can, you can make it an engaging experience in the classroom. Even if it's a very simple thing, it's really about giving the students voice and opportunity to participate in the in the in the learning, which I think has made it really quite valuable. So exactly that, Keith. It's and it's making it a, interactive and engaging. So that's one of the things. In terms of digital literacy, we don't have a policy, but we do have support. And in fact, what we've discovered over the years, and this is in particular to our project, this is sort of a general silt type learning, is where we made learning to use a computer compulsory. Students hated it and would never come to training. So what we've gone to is we've gone to a, what we call a self-assessment. And we've said to people, here are all the things you're going to need to do as a university student. If you feel you can't do them and you can't do them well, then here are all the training opportunities that we offer. And in fact, we found that more students go for training when you ask them to assess their, their skills and abilities in their educational context and make the choice about what the gaps are than when we made it a compliance orientated thing. The other thing we do, and it relates to something Lungile said earlier, I think about the policy for bring your own devices, is it's not compulsory in the class. Sometimes people will have, you know, there are, even if you had every student with a device and you've, you'd gone through a checklist and you knew that access was possible, access for everyone, someone's device will be broken, in for repair, and, you know, battery flat that day, forgotten at home. You can never have an environment where everyone has a device. So a lot of the learning that we see in the classroom is in pairs. So I think if we go back to some of the pictures I had earlier, you'll see it's not students sitting individually. It's about, it is about interaction and engagement and collaboration in terms of learning experience. If you say pair up with somebody and um, have a look for this, then two people just lean over you know, each other's sort of shoulders and, and start to engage. So I think, there's, um, I think there's opportunity for students to learn from each other. And, and I don't think we should be scared of that. And I think the lecturers in our pilot began to see some of the benefits of that as well. So I think I will come back to some questions. And I see is, yeah, there has been a lot of things about policy. And, and I suppose it's because we are wanting to ensure that our students all have the same, you know, it's a level playing field. But it isn't, because in the, even in the scenario of bring your own devices, 
somebody's got a better device than someone else. I mean, you should see how snooty students are about those that actually are lucky enough to have, you know, Apple machines. They all go, oh, that's a 20,000 machine. That one's got there. You know, unfortunately with technology, the issues around cost and, um, you know, and who can afford what come into play all the time as well. So I think it's a, I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Okay, so I'm going to um, just move on and then make sure there is time for questions. We've just got a couple of slides to wrap up with. So what we found overall, and this sort of comes back to the thing in the beginning about performance, and is it better and does technology in the classroom or out of the classroom mean students are going to do better? I don't know about the marks thing. We haven't gone there. But what we've seen is that it does transform the learning space. That discussion we were having about interactivity and the way teachers engage with students it changes that dynamic of in, of in classroom space, and it enables a kind of expansive version of teaching and learning where you can do a lot more variety in terms of the activities that you that you do, you know that you've been getting the students to engage with. The issue around increased mobility of learning and personal ownership were really important. We have had times when students have been loaned devices. And to us, it is so important that the device is something that the student owns themselves. We've, I think that's why we've come up with this very funny word around personal mobile devices. So it can't be something you can borrow or loan or just have access to on somebody else's. You have to make it your own, because you need to be able to experiment, play, download, try out, um, use you know, very much as a, as a personal as personal learning tool. And students really did value that. I mean, if, if there's a problem in a, you know, I think we had at the beginning of the year, um, we would give a student a tablet, and then they ended up getting a laptop through a um, university program or something, and they had brought their tablet back. They knew exactly how to wipe those tablets clean and set them back to default settings. You know, and I think that also shows that it's because they are using it personally. and um, and taking that responsibility and experimenting. And maybe that everything they do is legit, and maybe it's not all for learning. But if it supports them while they're at university, then personally, I don't see that that's a problem. I think if they're on Facebook saying, this math exam tomorrow is giving me such a big amount of stress. I wish the lecturer you know, covered this better. I don't know what I'm doing. And another student says, I'm with you. You know, I'm, you know, I feel your pain. Good luck for the test tomorrow. And it helps them feel more confident about going into the test, or at least they're not alone, that kind of thing. I think that's a hugely beneficial part of learning that we often miss. Okay. So one of the really big questions we always get asked is, what is the ideal device? So we've talked a lot about mobiles. Um, and in fact, smartphones are absolutely fine for a, almost a lot of what students need to do. The biggest issue for us as often as adults is the size of screens, for example, and the fact that we're not very dexterous with our fingers anymore. Um, so we, in terms of how students feel, if, they, if you told them they could only have one device, if you, if you said to them you can have one device only and you can have any device, what would it be? They would say the laptop is ideal, and that's because it's all-encompassing. It's not as good as a desktop. It's not as easy, portable, um, if, you know, small to fit in the bag, you know, online as a tablet, but they believe that a laptop would be more ideal. Although Jen's very recent focus groups this year suggest that actually for students they might not think that, that they might actually say if you had one device, a tablet is absolutely perfect. But at the time, in the, in the data that we're looking at from the last two years, they've generally said that. But the advantages of a tablet is the issue around mobility, light and portable. And a little bit answering Matichela's question of it fits in a handbag. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't get stolen, um, but it does mean that it's less obvious. And it's not like carrying a great big laptop backpack. Um, and it's, it's with you all the time. And it's sort of like a, you know, I think one student once when we asked them for um, in another project to, to give us a metaphor for their mobile devices, said it's like lipstick. You can just pull it out when you need it. Um, so it's this idea of being portable and mobile and flexible to use anywhere, anytime with not much fuss. 
the keyboard, it turns out, really did help a lot of students just because when you bring up the type screen in a tablet, your screen real estate becomes really small. And so the keyboard allowed students to have their, you know, their website or resources on the full screen and then be able to do the typing that they needed to. So if you were really budget conscious, then a tablet is absolutely fine, and as you can see, as you can see from the if you can remember from the beginning, so you can't see it now. But the tablets that we were trialing are really basic entry level tablets. It's perhaps not the cheapest tablet in South Africa, but it's it's sort of one of the lower end, and we found that it was absolutely fine for what students needed to do. Um, let me just see what my next. No, that's my concluding quote. So I just wanted to say one more thing about the tablet. Um, was we sort of called it like this, we had a word for it a while ago, which was something like um, the sort of learning sandwich. It was the sort of glue that held your learning together. So what it does is it enables students to get online, find the information they need, read the information, write their notes, synthesize their ideas, draft their concepts, work through their worksheets, and do all sorts of things that you required for your learning. But that last little bit where they had to produce the assignment and put in their references, format it well, um, get it ready for final production, they would almost always go to a desktop to do that because it was probably about having a keyboard and mouse, having a big screen, having the full size window for Microsoft Word or Excel or whatever it was. So the laptop, the laptop or tablet was good enough for a point, but in that final hall, they would almost always go to a lab for the last little bit. Um, and I think that just says that we can't do away with things like labs, but and desktops are very valuable. But it, what it showed us is that a tablet was almost perfect for almost every aspect of what they needed to do for their learning. So I think our conclusion comes from a quote from one of our academics in the pilot. And it showed that after a year of doing this, they were still learning. So the lecturer says, we're still in a process of morphing. Um, you know, we haven't figured out the answer now. You know, we've done this for a year. But actually, what I really know now is I have a really strong sense of what possibilities it holds for us. And they have a very writing intensive course. And so this lecturer said, it's allowed students to actually do different types of writing in class. They can be more reflective, which we know will involve, if they are reflective, improved learning opportunities. So you know, the lecturer can see that there is potential for new types of learning and improved reflection. And also, they said it allowed them to meet the students where they were. And that was really powerful for them because it helped them engage students in the learning. So in this case, there was no going back. And just giving it a go once in your teaching wasn't enough for you to actually really know whether this was going to improve. It's a long process. You've got to experience and work with it over a period of time. So that's us. And I see there are lots more questions. Um, so I am going to have a look at the chat and hand over to Nikki to post some questions and comments, please, colleagues. Comments. And I so appreciate the links that people have sent. Very keen to hear more about Alison Quibus's, um WhatsApp project as well. So Gabriel, the, the issues around the costs of the tablets, I'm going to let me just see how I quickly go back to the beginning and excuse the screen flipping, because I'm not quite sure how I'm going to go back on my screen. There we go. So this is the tablet that we bought. So for those people that were having a look at um, what it was, and the 2,541 Rand included the cover and keyboard um, and the tax. So um, the tablet itself was under 2,000 South African Rand. And it is an entry level pro line and does take a SIM card and does um, do Wi Fi. So Fiona, testing the tablets, we did pilot it with about 20 students um, before we decided on this particular model. And yes, we've, we've found that as um, researchers, Jen and I both actually have access to the tablets because we needed to understand how they worked um, as well ourselves. And we didn't give the tablets, these tablets, to the lecturers. The lecturers all had their own um, 
laptops, but we did think that actually it would have helped students in their learning if um, they um, if the lecturers had understood a little bit more about the device that the students had. So um, we think that would be something that we could do in terms of improvement. Really sadly, our project's finished, John. We've been doing this over a long time. Our Department of Higher Education hasn't given us any more um, funding. And in fact, is not funding us anymore. So we're in the sad position of we've got no idea what our, what our lecturers pilots. And we've done this across um, four universities in South Africa. The, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. We are making, we have made recommendations to our national education department. And in the next while, we will be producing guides and outputs that help people with the decision making around this. We hope to be able to have guides for institutions, guides for um, um, academics, guides for students. So we're hoping that the output of this project would at least help other people to get it off the ground. And um, we will be telling people um, about the device and what we thought it was good enough for, that kind of thing. I'm just going to go back over some of the questions and comments. I've got a good one for you, Cheryl. Oh, thank you, Nikki. Um, so a lot of folks have been talking about WhatsApp. And I notice a lot of my African colleagues um, at other institutions are very fond of using WhatsApp with students. I was just wondering whether, you know, what are we missing out on when we, you know, equate WhatsApp with mobile learning? And I know Corbis has had some interesting comments, I think, around, I think it was Corbis, let me just check my thing again. Oh, he said yes, students are still hesitant to use mobile devices for internet uh, beyond WhatsApp, and we were having a discussion about, um, you know, because they perceive the university LMS, um, like an app to use the university LMS on their phones, actually they think it costs more data than WhatsApp. Um, so I don't know if you want to tell us, t talk a little bit more about that. So are we missing out on using mobile for learning with students when we only can think about WhatsApp? Mm, yes, it's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, I don't. I think there's a lot that's really valuable about WhatsApp. So, I mean, I'm sure as Quibus and um, Alice have found, a lot of what we see p um, lecturers using um, or students doing it is informally. Like, I think when you have a WhatsApp learning space, if there's one that the lecturer is in, there's going to be plenty more the lecturer is not part of. So there's a lot of learning happening that we don't see and we don't know about. And there always has been. So the teacher can't control all of the learning space. Um, so I think one of the things we have to be prepared for is the fact that learning, spa learning happens in spaces we just are not aware of and can't control. But I also think um, the issue around, around access to LMS and WhatsApp being so cheap is probably why students are very reluctant to move out of what they see as being you know, the cheap way of, of interacting with each other into the sort of more formal way. Last year when we had the, um, the protests in South Africa, um, the cell phone company zero rated university learning management systems. And that, that should have meant that um, students could have accessed sites that had core study materials online for free from their provider, so MTN, Vodacom, et cetera. I think that is something we absolutely should continue pushing with the cell phone companies. I mean, nobody's, you know, it's, costs of cell phone access are not likely to improve for, you know, or those normal, us all normal people, like for average, for society. Sorry, I put that really badly. Yes, Nikki's right. We pay far too much for data. But educational data shouldn't cost. Um, and in fact, students were very suspicious of that um, as to whether they could get onto the LMS for free during that time. But some certainly did manage to. And that, that was really helpful. The other reason why I think they're often um, reluctant to use other things, students, is because it's the academics con academic controlled space. It's like the classroom. The learning management system is the space where academics are putting content. We don't often find students contributing content there. Students are sharing and contributing content in other spaces that don't have our control. And um, so 
you know, sometimes it's okay if all they're doing is just reading and accessing the resources, because then at least we know that they can get to the resources they need to when they need it. So, um, yeah, but I mean, there are so many things that one, as um, Cola said, you know, WhatsApp is just one tool. So I'm not sure it's up to us as academics and teachers to decide what tools are good for learning. I think we should ask students. I think a great thing in the class would be to say, look, I'm, I'm really excited about you using your own devices in the classroom. Please come and share with us what learning tools you're using and, and what you find valuable. So in the case where we had the lecturer wanting to do the, um, the videos and she suddenly went, I don't know what software to use, the students suddenly started saying, oh, well, we use this and try this app. And so she didn't need to know it herself. She needed to enable and legitimize the um, the learning and the knowledge that the students had and bring it into the classroom. Okay, I'm pausing again just to read the questions. Okay, so Tony's asking about perceptions of the LMS and um, whether they see it as being expensive. I mean, I don't, we haven't got research on that, I don't think. Um, I think what we see it, them perceiving it of perceiving it as is more the formal learning space, not the not the space where they are. So it doesn't matter how much lecturers try and engage students in in participating in the LMS. Um, a lot of the time, it's about um, that's the space that the lecturer is guiding, even the discussion forums and the chats, and they find, as Nicola says, alternative spaces for their own um, for their own questions. But yes, I mean, I think issues of bandwidth are a problem, except that YouTube consumes huge amounts of bandwidth, and students are on YouTube all the time, you know, often for everything. And it does. I've watched my nine-year-old go through a gig an hour on YouTube, um, so it really is huge. So I think, yeah, Tony, I, I'd agree with you on that. Um, I'm just sort of skimming up, and I know I lose a lot of questions. But um, no, we don't, aside from this one opportunity, this one moment when we had the protests and there was a lot of pressure on the cell phone companies to zero rate learning management systems and university, thing, university learning sites, there isn't any discount for education use, as far as I'm aware. Um, And I mean, I think we moan in South Africa, Gabriel, but um, we know it's, it could well be worse elsewhere. I hear Mauritius is great, and isn't that, if we look at where the best bandwidth is in, um, in Africa, Mauritius and Egypt, Mohammed, I think that was the last time I, when I looked at stats. I don't know if people in those contexts experience great bandwidth in reality, but that's what um, the stats are supposed to say, or stats suggest to us. Indeed, Cheryl, the things we want, we always want is better bandwidth, and we also, I think at this stage, would also love more time, because we see it's now three minutes to two o'clock, and um, I know we've still got colleagues typing and engaging. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Um, yeah, both Cheryl and Jen, thank you so much um, from the Emerge Africa team and also all our participants here today. Uh, let's keep the conversa conversation going in the Facebook event page. Uh, feel free to post some questions. And also, folks are talking about sharing their research or, or little findings or bouncing off ideas. Yeah, you, you're welcome to use the Facebook event um, page for that. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Jakob, is there anything more you'd like to say, or Cheryl or Jen? Cheryl, was there something you wanted to add? No, I just want to say thanks to everybody for being so engaging. I feel like I've missed an awful lot in the chat, so I'm looking forward to going back and reading the chat transcript as well. And I'm very happy to be online on the events page on Facebook. And I look, for, hope you will share some um, of your resources, even if it's things that you are finding interesting or um, topical around this issue. It would be really good to talk about it and to keep sharing this experience.
Great. Thanks again, Cheryl. Um, Jen, you want to say any, any last words? Um, it's just that it's so interesting. I didn't even realize that, we were almost, that the time is almost finished. Uh, it's definitely a really nice space to be. I think Sheila and I, we don't feel like we're just sitting and doing the research. It's nice to hear what's going on outside of UCT as well. So this is really nice. Thank you, everyone.